switch from English to French on a regular basis, so maybe the introduction of Mark on how to use the headsets are relevant for part of the audience. Um, so this phone has been in existence for some 30 years. And so what? What has been done? How has it been used for? Who has benefited from it? Where in Canada did the claims come from and for what types of claims? Where did the money come from and where did it go? What is the present status and how did we get there? Well, let's see how the data of the past 30 years provide an answer to these questions. And what is the story this data tell? It will, stay, it will set the stage for today's discussions. So let us begin with the beginning of the story when the fund was established in 1999 and the premises on which this fund was created. En créant la caisse le 24 avril. By uh, creating uh, the fund on April 20, 1989, Canada gave itself a system. There was a fund. So this is a completely different fund. Now, the president of fund inherited the $149 million, uh, which uh, remained in the previous fund. This was our starting capital. But there's also a certain number of special aspects mentioned in the new law, which govern our present fund. The major element is uh, the international aspect of the SOPF, the new fund. And this was done by ratifying these two conventions, uh, that on the civil responsibility and the one on the international fund. This is a first important fact, an important element of the new fund. Another important aspect is uh, the access uh, to justice. Why do I speak of access to justice? Well, that's because, and let me see uh, the order it's presented. It's uh, because this uh, new fund was created uh, to be uh, a fund uh, of the first access. The other fund was um, uh, final access, except for fishermen. Uh, the previous fund was used in only 21 cases. The new fund was created to be a fund that the victims can access directly without needing to go before the shipping companies before that. Another important aspect is that the new fund covers mysterious spills, those that uh, where we cannot uh, find the ship responsible for this uh, spill. We know it comes from a ship, but we don't know which one. In such cases, uh, victims can be um, paid directly from our fund. At the beginning, the, there was a limit of 100 million per incident, uh, which is no longer the case. That same year, 1989, uh, the administrator at the time, Mr. Peter Choup, organized a conference with uh, different um, interveners to discuss uh, the new fund with them. And 30 years later, we once again have a new conference, similar to the conference of 1989, which will allow us to see what was accomplished uh, during these last 30 years. As uh, Mrs. Pham mentioned, many things have happened in 30 years. A few months after we joined, joined the International Fund, uh, there was the Rio Orinoco accident, uh, which spilled um, oil off the shores of Alticasti Island. Uh, the Coast Guard also had access uh, to the fund. There were new 
international conventions that were signed and later they were included in the Canadian system. So here you can see these uh, different treaties, conventions, and recently in December 2018, there were important amendments uh, to the law which have brought changes that uh, Mrs. Fan mentioned and that you can find here. So here is where we're at uh, 30 years later. We have a fund uh, that uh, is made up 480 million. The fund has been improved over the years, but there have been many incidents uh, which were discussed in the media. Administrators had to face uh, this uh, media scrutiny. Many cases went to before the courts. So many things have happened in the last 30 years. As I mentioned, uh, today's uh, conference is an echo of the one that occurred uh, 30 years ago. It also allows us to continue discussions with different uh, stakeholders, uh, including those uh, involved in our fund. So every administrator of uh, the fund has uh, met uh, different challenges over the years. But uh, in the last 30 years, we've had 30 annual reports tabled before Parliament by the different administrators. And this is our basic uh, source of information on the fund. I believe we have a copy of each one of these uh, annual reports at uh, the uh, entranceway. And I thought it would be on the tables, but uh, you will also have uh, our last annual report, the 30th, which is now public. It was presented by the minister before both houses of parliament. So we have uh, paper copies here, and it will be put online on the web today. So to uh, prepare the table for today's discussions, we will explore what was included in these annual reports. But we've tried to have um, an overview of uh, these 30 years, and we will get into certain details. So here is where we started off on the left, and here is uh, where we are at today on the right-hand side. So the fund is basically a number in the Consolidated Fund of Canada. It today represents $408 million. And that will be my starting point to tell you the story of the fund. And what a story lies behind this number. So we had a 149 million at the start. We are now at 408 million. How did we reach this sum? Well, there were expenses of 104 million and the revenue of 363 million. In the meantime, we've had more than 400 uh, claims uh, sent to the uh, fund. So basically, what does this tell us? It tells us uh, that over 30 years, uh, the fund spent a little bit more than the maximum limit that it had in the first year, which was 100 million per incident. That was uh, the limit in 1989. In 30 years, we have spent 104 million in all for more than 400 uh, cases, 400 claims, as well as all the other activities of the fund. What's striking when we look at these numbers is that we have um, a lot of revenue. Our capital fund has tripled in the last 30 years. So if we look into the details, what has happened? Our expenses uh, represent 25 million in claims, um, amounts for the international fund and uh, operations. On the revenue side, we have received 358 million in received interest. We've also 
amounts of recovery, $5 million. And what must be included in the revenue are the uh, contributions of contributors, which were zero dollars in the last 30 years. So basically, what does this tell us? It tells us the story of a country that was uh, very lucky to not have any major spills, but which is uh, covered uh, if it does happen. Canada is covered also through its international partners who are present here with us today. The amount uh, we pay to uh, the International Fund uh, have been our main expenditure over the years. I'd like to underline uh, that the reduction in world spills is a world uh, reality because of the improvement in inspections throughout the world. So memorize uh, this table because uh, we'll now look into in more detail what uh, is behind every one of these numbers. First of all, what is behind uh, the 25 million in payments? So this graph shows us what was paid every year for Canadian claims. The total is close to 25 million. Now, in the brochures uh, you have before you, I b believe we mentioned an amount of 24 million for claims. Actually, it's 24.9 million. So we rounded it up to 25 million. So don't be surprised if in the brochure you see 24 million. And here in the presentation, I speak of 25 million. So the total is close to 25 million. What you don't see because of the distance is that the first uh, line is uh, that of $1 million in expenditures. So you can see that uh, for many years we spent uh, less than $1 million per year. Why? If uh, this money was not uh, used uh, to um, pay for major spills, the fund was used uh, to pay for different small claims uh, caused by small and medium-sized uh, spills. These occur every year in Canada. The smallest claim was for $217. It came uh, from an individual following a mysterious spill. The largest claim was uh, $4.5 million in the case of choke termination, and that uh, explains the record amount paid in the last year, which was up to $8 million. Concerning the amounts paid by the fund, only three accidents cost more than $1 million. So the choke termination, which we mentioned, which is the one you see at the bottom, this occurred in the winter. And that's why it was uh, so expensive. Uh, there was uh, 4.3 million um, in the claim for the two people who made the request. The second is a uh, Maratasa, the one you see on top. That's an incident that occurred in Vancouver in 2017. Uh, 2.4 million paid for three claimants. And the third largest incident, the Penda Lily in the Queen Charlotte uh, Islands in uh, 2003, for $1.7 million. So these are the major incidents in Canada during the last uh, 30 years. We should also mention the Farley Moat, which cost $1.9 million for all the claims. We'll be discussing the Farley Moat case uh, several times more during the day. I should also mention the claim from uh, BC, 2.7 million for the Crown Forest. The administrator had made an offer of 1.9 million, but uh, this was not accepted within the time limits and thus was not paid out. That being said, once uh, we eliminate these uh, major claims, about 60% of the 413 claims we have received were for amounts of $30,000 and less. So many small claims, very few large ones. 
So, we use the fund for all of these claims. That was the objective. Now, what do we see here? We see that over the years, the number of claims have increased. In the first decade, the average was seven uh, claims per year. In the second, 12 per year. And in the uh, third decade, 18 claims uh, per year. So yes, the number of claims has increased, but we know that the, case, that the fund could increase many more if uh, claimants hear about the existence of the fund. And that's why we've um, publicized the work of the fund in the last few years. So what kind of um, the ship uh, has uh, created these bills? As uh, you can see, the large um, commercial volumes are those who create the less to claim, the smallest number of claims. Now, uh, between these commercial ve vehicles, uh, you have uh, what's available. We rebuilt uh, this data based on our annual reports, and there were certain um, uh, information that was absent, and the overships. So w these other ships. So what are these other ships? These other ships are those not placed in previous categories, especially abandoned ships and um, pleasure ships. So this is the category that is the most important for creating these claims. As you can see, commercial ships uh, and um, all ships uh, have created the smallest number of uh, claims because the system has uh, played its uh, role. But uh, uh, fishing boats and abandoned boats have created the greatest number of claims. So the fund was very useful for this kind of uh, ship and a situation when we speak of uh, mystery spills. In the previous slide, uh, we showed uh, the number of claims and uh, the amounts asked for in dollars. And here you can see that um, the oil ships uh, were the lowest in the number of claims. But uh, concerning barges, uh, and the tow ships, uh, these are the categories that created the greatest amount in dollars. Followed closely by the other ship uh, category, where we can find abandoned uh, ships. So this slide shows us uh, the, the average amount of a claim per type of a ship. So once again, we can see that in the barges and uh, tow ships, we see the greatest number of claims. But uh, the mystery spills, which is an important number of claims, uh, represents small amounts. It's the same thing for the fishing boats, which create many claims, but of a small amount. So now let us go more into detail, let us uh, zoom into these mystery spills. These uh, mystery spills represent about 25% of the claims we've received. We have not paid damages for these uh, 95 cases because some of them were not uh, acceptable. We've uh, paid for 77 of them, and one case is still being evaluated on the 24th of April. So we paid a total of $2 million for the 77 cases, which represent an amount of 21700 on average. Now, if the case had not been there, victims could not be compensated for this kind of uh, damage because we cannot link uh, this uh, damage to a ship owner. Now, from which part of Canada have we received the claims made to the fund? The fund has received claims from 
all provinces and territories of Canada except for Alberta, Saskatchewan, and the Yukon. So the uh, blue lines on the graph show the number of claims received uh, per province in the last 30 years. As you can see, BC is uh, way ahead of all other provinces, followed by Quebec, uh, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, and Ontario. The orange line shows uh, the total amount paid by province. As you can see, half the claims originate in BC. The others came from uh, Quebec for about uh, 25 percent, and the rest is Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, and Ontario. So this uh, trend indicating that we've received more claims from BC than from elsewhere started in 2000. Why? Well, the answer will be soon available. I want to uh, zoom in on another s important source of claims, and uh, these are the uh, abandoned, derelict, or wrecked vessels. By the fund over the past 30 years, the abandoned, derelict, or wrecked vessels, as seen earlier, they represent one out of four claims received. These types of claims appear during fiscal year 2002-2003. This slide shows in blue from 2002-2003 to current the number of such claims received and in orange the number of other claims received by the fund. So the, in orange that's all the other claims that are not derelict or wrecked vessels. And this starts in 2002-2003. Did it move? Slide cares. I see. Okay. So, as shown in this slide, most of the claims from such vessels came from BC. So, if you cannot read the legend, the claims from BC are in blue, and from the rest of Canada are in orange. Each band represents a five year interval. So, the first one being 202 206, and the last one being the past two years. So, as you can see, 73%, so three-quarters three of these claims, so claims for derelict vessels, have come from BC since 2002-2003. This explains why BC has become the most important source of claims to the fund over the past 17 years. Donc, cette proportion significative des réclamations est une... So, this indicates uh, the advantages of the fund in access to uh, justice because claims against uh, this type of uh, ship owner is difficult even when we can identify the uh, ship owner. Another zoom now. A zoom on uh, the uh, claims uh, related to tankers. As we mentioned in the past, uh, in 1989, when we created the fund, uh, this was associated with international law on um, the responsibility of tankers, which was seen at the time as a major risk. As we've seen, tankers have uh, created only uh, 13 claims of the fund in the last 30 years. So here we zoom in on these uh, 13 claims, which represent 3% of the claims, and which has a total exposure of $600,000 for the fund. That is 1.6% of the total exposure uh, of the fund, an average of 46000 So what happened with these 13 claims? Only six claims uh, were paid for by the fund for a total amount of 400000 The others were paid uh, directly by the responsible parties. Among these six claims, one was identified later on as a mysterious spill in a port. So, and the fund paid only 150,000 in 30 years for, cause, for claims caused by tankers, which represents less than 1% of what was paid by the fund over the past 30 years. So, who claimed with the fund? Coast Guard has been the fund's main claimant. 
we received 284 claims from the Canadian Coast Guard, and uh, for um, which total 28 million worth of claim. And in terms of amount paid, we pay 22 million to the Coast Guard, which is close to 90% of the total amount paid by the fund over the past 30 years. Who were the other claimants? The other claimants have been mainly ports and harbors, terminals, industrial shippers, such as mining companies owning a dock, municipalities, shipping companies, other federal departments or agencies, fishing industry, response organizations, tourism organizations, two claims from indigenous groups, and two from provincial governments, including the one that I mentioned before, where there was a 1.7 offer on the table, which was not accepted on time, plus a handful of claims from individuals, especially uh, recreational boaters. Il y a eu très peu de demandes d'indemnisation pour des dommages autres. Very few claims for damages other than uh, intervention, uh, than environmental interventions, uh, except for the first few years of the uh, funds where we had cases of contamination of the uh, uh, lobster pods. Now, another question: Do people know of the existence of the fund? Recently. We have uh, seen economic damages uh, caused to municipalities because of the closing of uh, municipal waterworks uh, due to a spill. This implies uh, that uh, we should be receiving a new type of claim. Preeminent claimant in the history of the fund, most of the claims that we had were for cleanup, for cleanup costs, for preventive measures, for federal monitoring costs, but the, the fund can indemnify much more than that. So with new types of claimants, potential claimants, knowing the fund, we may get a more diverse portfolio of claims, as seen in the most recent cases that we have with some municipalities and the closure of uh, municipal uh, treatment uh, plants. Before we move to the other elements of the balance sheet, do you have any question on the data that relate to the payment of claims? If there are any questions on that, we could entertain them now before I move to the rest. Yes, question? We had only two claims in the history of the fund. Uh, I know that one was the, uh, and, but, Barely nothing was paid because one was, and I have to review to review the claims, that one was undocumented, so it was not possible to pay it, and the other one was uh, after time bar or something like that. So, you know, there was, I would say, a knowledge issue uh, from the claimant side, which becomes um, an education issue on the fund side. So it's why we, we are trying to do more outreach so that if there are some claimants that have valid claims to file with the fund, they have you know, to, to know about the existence of the fund, to know about the time limitations, to know about the processes of the fund, to make sure that the claims are properly documented. Some other questions before we move on? Yet? Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, first, thank you for the presentation. A lot of figures, but very interesting. The Coast Guard is obviously a big fan of the SOPF. Um, and I was wondering, out of the claims that they're making, are you able to divide between what is their monitoring costs and what is actual layout of cleanup for third party uh, companies hired by the Coast Guard, for example? Um, we could do it by coming back, I guess. That's not, a, that's not an information that we capture now on the, our internal data management system. We are trying to develop it more so that we can capture more data. But I would say that if you want to go back to the past 30 years, it would be almost impossible to say because the annual reports are not necessarily detailed enough to be able to reconstruct this data. And just sending people to national archives to check that, you know, would be very time demanding. So that's the type of, we, we try to refine the data that we capture 
Um, and moving on, actually, this year we have uh, an upgrade of our data management system uh, that we worked out with our in-house experts to make sure that we capture as much as we can to be able to you know, to report on that. But no, uh, the, the short answer is no, we cannot, uh, you know, we cannot give you this, this data right now. Oui, there was another one. Hi, good morning. Um, thank you for, for um, providing your information. I just had a couple questions on the monitoring of your mystery spills. You know, what's the preventative measures being taken to that? Because it's all, obviously it's very high. So what's being done to monitor more of that versus paying out a mystery spill? Well, and, and my second one is um, the surrounding areas of, of um, the claims where they're being um, paid out and let's face it, First Nations are throughout this country. So are they being considered as the fallout area from these spills? And environmentally, things don't show overnight. So are there continuous testings in the area? Because you mentioned a time frame on a claim and that sometimes it's not considered because it's beyond the time frame. So I was wondering you know, what that time frame looked like as well. Okay, uh, the first question was um, about monitoring for spills. So we don't do that. We are strictly in the business of assessing the claims. So if an event happens somewhere and it causes damages to somebody uh, and there is a claim that is put on our desk, we will assess the claim and pay for it. But we don't, we are not in the operations, you know. So we just receive claims. So short answer, uh, no, we don't monitor for mystery spills. If there are mystery spills in Canada and the municipality or the port or the terminal operator or the marina or another ship spots one and report to the authorities, you know, the authorities will take care of it, and eventually I will get a claim, but I don't monitor that. Uh, in terms of uh, timelines, I would say that's a very short answer, uh, because it can be more complicated than that, is that it's a two-year time bar. So, you know, just keep that in mind, two years. Um, so it means that you have to be able to put something together within two years. So it's more complex than that, but you know, very, very short answer. Um, are we fine with the questions? Can I move on? Jani, oui, c'est beau. So the big chunk of our expenses is the $57 uh, to the international fund. Um, and as mentioned, and before, before, before I mention it, actually, this is how it was, uh, it was spread over years. So it's not a fixed premium that we pay every year. It depends on what happens in other parts of the world that have generated claims somewhere else in the world and where all the, 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 the players of international regime, including Canada, will contribute. So as you can see, there are variations, but you can see also that it's going down. So it was much higher in the earlier years that is now, and it reflects on this decrease in the tanker incidents that I evoked just earlier. So contribution to the IOPC funds is more than an insurance, and I want to highlight that because it's not that we paid a 57 million insurance pre premium over years with the idea of getting some payment in case something happens. Uh, well, yes, it can, it's, it's an insurance also. It's what happened in the Rio Orinoco case where the IOPC fund indemnified directly the Canadian claimants. But also when there are claims in Canada uh, where the IOPC fund could be eventually caught in, they are party by statute. So they've been party by statute in Canada a number of times. It gives them the opportunity also to explain to the Canadian judges or courts what the international regime is about. And we currently, uh, there is currently actually a case that is pending in BC, even at an in Stewart, where uh, the international fund is a party by statute. I would say that a uh, very important thing in joining the international regime by Canada is to make sure that the, the, um, 
the international the shipping in Canada will be able to be covered by insurance and especially by international insurance because when Canada was outside of the international framework it was very difficult uh, for ship owners to subscribe to uh, the liability coverage that was needed so one of the the key element in joining the international regime is also to be on the same wavelength with the international um, insurance world and to make sure that the coverage in Canadian waters can be can be subscribed with with insurers. So this is this is something very important. This is something actually that explains why we paid only 25 million over the past 30 years because many claims were just settled directly by the ship owners and their insurers uh, and it's why we got so few um, so few claims and why these claims were for these uninsured ships, small odd vessels. Uh, it also allows our fund to be part of an international web of expertise and this is very important especially if we have a big spill one day we will want to make sure that we have an international network uh, that we can that can back us in this exercise of indemnity in compensating claimants and also a practice that has been adopted by all administrators is to align their assessment methodology and approach on what was developed on the international front. So there is really a continuum between the assessment practices and approaches developed at the international level by the international fund, but also under the bankers conventions in the in the insurance world uh, and the, 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 the situations that are covered solely uh, by Canadian law because they are not covered by international conventions. So there is a continuum and this continuum, the whole inspiration, if I can say so, have come from the developments that take place with the uh, IOPC fund. Then if we focus to our uh, other and last uh, item for expenses, that's the operating expenses of the fund for some 22 million over 30 years. So as you can see, until 2006, 2007, and here I have to find my, the right slide. Uh, the, the operating expenses were around $500,000 uh, per year until they started to grow and to raise in 2006, 2007. So these years are when the Access to Information Act started to be applied to the administrator's office. Uh, where um, the management system were upgraded. Uh, l'informatisation du système de gestion. So the computerization of the system, the website, uh, the professionalization of the uh, team, the increase in the number of cases. You saw that over the years the cases uh, have uh, increased and the increase in the size of our team. So this started with Alfred Pop, who's uh, here present, but it increased uh, with uh, my appointment and that of uh, Marc Gautier. The interest, so that's always a mystery. Where does this money come from? Well, it comes mainly from interest. So the lion's share of the revenue have come from the interest generated by the original one, uh, 149 million. Uh, the Act states that the Minister of Finances provides monthly interest on the balance of the fund. Although these interests are smaller than the interest rates for Treasury bonds, the fund received huge amounts of interest during its first years. And for the ones who cannot read the line, the first years, the, the amount of interest each year was between 16 and 18 million dollars per year. Uh, until interest rates started to drop around the year 2000. And the amount of interest collected yearly started to drop as well. So as shown in the slide, the fund received yearly between 12 and 18 million dollars for the first 20 years of its existence. So that's, that's the secret of the 408 million dollars now. 
Now, the recovery side, as mentioned, there was a $5 million in recovery. Une fois l'indemnisation versée, l'administrateur... Once claims are paid, the administrator can uh, turn against uh, the responsible person, and the law states that the administrator must uh, do everything possible to do so. Here, the yearly recovery that we got, um, and if you think uh, $5 million out of 25, it means that it would be rule of a fund, a 20% recovery rate. But this is, this is misleading. This is not the right ratio. Why? Because out of this $5 million, actually, you have only 3.5 million that were recovered because of claims from Canadian claimants. The balance is some recovery that we got from the IOPC fund when some big cases were closed at some points and we got some money back. So it was in our financial statements, it was in the recovery, but it was not recovery from claims that we, that we paid. So it's why you have this big spike, for example, in 2013, 2014. Uh, there was a big uh, payback from the IOPC fund at that time. So if you base yourself on the 3.5 million, then the recovery rate becomes 15%. That's not good. However, however, if you consider that you cannot have recovery from mystery spills because you have no owner anyways and you subtract this from the total, and when you take out also the, um, uh, the derelict vessels, you know, that, or abandoned vessels for which you can barely find an owner, and if you concentrate, you know, you, you are already at 30% recovery. And if we concentrate only on the cases where after having made the assessment, should we go for reco actively for recovery actions or not? Um, well, that's a 54 re recovery rate. So it's not bad. It just depends what you focus on. And you, always, you also have to remember that the access to justice dimension of this fund is that the claimant get paid anyway, and we have a burden of finding someone to revert to. So uh, and that's, that's a way to explain, you know, it depends what you are looking at, depending on the sh share, you know, do you look at the whole pie or do you look just at some elements of a pie? Uh, it, it explains how we can get different ratios depending on what we look at. So, um, as mentioned, a uh, faible taux de recouvrement et également. Uh, that's also an indication of uh, what the uh, fund has received. It's because recovery is difficult that uh, being able to access a fund, first off, is advantageous. Mystery line, what, which was the zero uh, from the contributors. Um, why? Well, actually, the contributors did contribute, but very early on when there was the previous fund. With the previous fund, there was a 15 cent per ton levy, uh, which was collected from 1972 to, 60, to 1976. Uh, 36 million were collected. Uh, and with the interest, which how we got our $149 million uh, seed money, so to speak, when we started in 89. Um, when the SOPF was established, the levy was 30 cents per turn in the Act. So the levy has always been in the Act. It's just that and it's been, it's, been, um, it's been adjusted every year, so this year it would be 51 cents per ton. It's just that it's not been activated. It remained dormant because we have enough money. So the levy has not been imposed over the whole history of the fund. So, en résumé, l'histoire des 30 dernières années... As a summary, the uh, story of the last uh, 30 years, as we see in the uh, annual report, confirms uh, what uh, was thought of at the beginning. Uh, the international funds help, help us. There's also the fact that uh, it's the uh, IOPC that paid for the biggest bill in Canada in the last 30 years. The role of the insurers in uh, compensation and uh, ships for which insurance is uh, compulsory 
have uh, an impact on the fund. The special role of the uh, Coast Guard uh, as um, and the access to justice of the fund, be it for incidents of mystery spills or in cases of pollution. What the legislator had not foreseen 1989 was that the fund would be mostly used for small ships, abandoned ships, also for ships and boats. What's the situation today, 30 years without a main spill? Money, partnerships, expertise uh, are there uh, to face uh, catastrophe if it happens. We have the availability of uh, funds to uh, compensate victims of a uh, myriad of uh, incidents uh, throughout Canada. Uh, the effort deployed to have the polluter pay without uh, delaying compensation to the victim. The intensification of the impact of the fund throughout Canada mostly for coastal communities, and a growing discussion with interveners and partners. This year, the 30th anniversary, is a good time to have the fund better known and to uh, increase the dialogue. In this 30th year, we will be sharing different tools with you, including a new version of the uh, claimant's uh, manual, um, 30 years of decisions concerning resume, of uh, claims and another electronic um, presentation which will present uh, the activity of the fund for the last 30 years. So please sign up if you want to receive all this information. So we have a few minutes left. Are there any questions? Yes. For the excellent presentation. Um, my question is, has the fund paid claims in any U.S., Canada transboundary spill cases? Um, and whether you have or you haven't, does the fund have any operating guidance in place as to how you would work with the National Pollution Fund Center in the U.S. in the event that you have such a transboundary spill? Uh, I know that there was one claimant from the U.S. in the whole history of the fund, and uh, we can revert maybe later with details on that. Uh, Jani will uh, will spin a, a tweet uh, information on that. Um, uh, otherwise, uh, that, uh, no, there has not been any transboundary, um, um, I would say, spill since the fund. The one that was just before the fund was the Nestuka, uh, but it was under the old fund. Uh, and uh, that's one of the issue or files that is on the front uh, of uh, our, our radar screen is how to work with the uh, with the U.S. So uh, we held a workshop on that about 18 was it last year, 18 months ago, and we are working on the second edition, um, which was supposed to take place in June, but is being uh, rescheduled for. September, so uh, we will uh, we will work with uh, our counterparts uh, of the U.S. Uh, fund, but also with all our partners, uh, including uh, the international insurers, the international the international fund, uh, ITOP, who's here as well today, uh, and um, and the the two coast guards, Canadian and U.S., because they are likely to be the, the, the main claimants in case of uh, of an incident. Another question. Oui. Yes. And thank you very much for an excellent presentation. One question. Claims for environmental damage and claims for First Nations. Do you have experience on these type of claims? I think you mentioned two claims from First Nations. On environmental damage, restoration. Do you have a lot of experience on that? We haven't had uh, in in the recent, and I'm looking at I'm looking at Alfred, who have a who has a longer memory than I do, uh, but uh, we 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 haven't had. Um, so I know that that's the type of discussions that are very prominent now and that are coming back also uh, on the radar screen because of um, a recommendation in a national energy board. Um, 
report that was issued a number of months ago and one of the recommendations was that the Canadian legislator looks at what we call the pure environmental damage uh, which is not an economic damage but like the value of environment for itself which is something that is very difficult to assess. Uh, the US have this kind of it's possible in the US, but they have a legislation that really maps it out. Um, we have that on some other legislations, including for the rail fund, which is another fund that uh, is under our hat, Mark and I, uh, where there is uh, indemnification of uh, pure environmental laws. Uh, but for the SOPF, no, that's not in the legislation. It's something I understand that the government will think about but uh, I'm not the one who's uh, doing the act you know I'm just within my mandate assessing claims on the basis of a legislation that is in force at the, t at the time of incident any other question any question from the web uh, participants Jenny where is Jenny any questions from the web participants ah a question there is there a target where you, uh, in the act, where you could institute the levy back to per ton of oil moved? Is there a target if the fund decreased to 100 million, 200 million, 50 million? Is it's just the judgment of yeah. politicians, the, the Canadian people? Well, I guess that we will need to have some reasons to do so. So unless we have a big accident or unless I pay so many small claims that at the end of the day, the level of my fund goes really down. You know, there is no specific reason for the time being to, uh, to, reinstate, the, to reinstate the levy. But there is no target in the act per se. Thank you. Thank you. Hélène, merci beaucoup pour ta présentation.